Hi, welcome back. So last time we looked at Euripides' back eye, we were talking about irony um, and about the way that Pentheus behaves when Dionysus is presented to him in disguise. What follows from that is a messenger report. So today we're going to focus on the device of the messenger speeches in Euripides' back eye and what they really offer. So the messenger arrives just after Pentheus has locked Dionysus up. Messenger speeches are really important in Greek tragedy because they provide information from further afield, basically. The world of a tragedy is usually set around a household in a particular city, and so if any information is needed from off stage, characters would tend to come on um, and off from either side, from the acidoi, and report on that. They can also provide testimony from far earlier and far later, or get an eyewitness or something like that. In Euripides' back eye, the messenger appears himself as an eyewitness, having gone up to the mountain. So he comes back down to report to Pentheus. Um, and what's interesting is that a lot of the things that Pentheus has really been concerned about, according to the messenger speech, are completely unfounded. So we remember that Pentheus is worried about the back eye because he thinks that they're going to be conducting um, extramarital or premarital sexual practice, so moikeia. And the messenger comes down to say that actually this is not the case. So the messenger's really reluctant and we're at line roughly 660 if you're reading along with me today. Um, he's really reluctant to speak to Pentheus, much like the messengers, the shepherd, etc. were all very reluctant to speak to Oedipus and Oedipus the king. Pentheus, like Oedipus, is a very headstrong, determined king. So the messenger makes clear um, that actually they were all fast asleep, bodies relaxed, some resting on the boughs of silver fir while others used the oak leaves as a pillow, down on the ground in careless innocence, not drunk with wine as you said, or with music or pipes, nor hunting Eros in the wild. So the messenger says well actually Pentheus, the back eye were just asleep, they'd not got any men with them, they weren't drunk, it was actually all pretty innocent. Um, and here we get Agawe, Pentheus's own mother is involved. So when she wakes the women up, the messenger goes on to describe how wild and beautiful they are. And we get really interesting details here, like the, um, the women who are recent mothers are suckling wild animals because they've left their own children at the family home back down in Thebes. So we see those whose breasts were full from giving birth, who'd left their babies back at home, were cradling deer or wolf cubs in their arms, which sucked their white milk. On their heads, they set their wreaths of ivy, oak or flowering greenbriar. When one taps her thyrsus on the rock, the stream of dewy water rushes out. Another strikes her fennel on the ground, and there, right there, the god makes wine pour forth. If any girl was thirsty for some milk, she stretched the earth with just her fingertips and out spurt jets of gushing white. Their wands of ivy drip with honey, flowing sweet. So, everything that actually the chorus have said before about milk and honey and wine <laughs> and, and water is verified by the messenger report. So what the chorus have said holds true, what Pentheus has assumed holds false. So the messenger provides a really interesting insight that makes the audience align with the Bacchae and with Dionysus and not so much with Pentheus. And it's interesting that Euripides' tragedy is not called Pentheus. So Euripides aligns his audience with the back eye and with Dionysus himself, which given the context, remember this is being performed at the Dionysia, is perhaps a suitable way of celebrating Dionysus as a god. So <coughs> um, what they have then, the messenger and his cowherd friends, is a dilemma. We join together, shepherds and cowherds both, arguing with each other and debating about the marvellous miracles we saw. A man from town who had a way with words said to us all, Come now, inhabitants of these holy mountain valleys, shall we hunt Agawe? Pentheus's mother, drive her out from these bacchic rites and please the king. And according to the messenger, who's really keen on pleasing Pentheus, we like this plan, <laughs> and we hid in the tufty thickets ready to pounce. However, um, Agawe is one step ahead. Just then Agawe had leapt right next to me. I jumped to catch her, so I hoped. 
I left the bushes I had made my hiding place, but she called out, swift hunting dogs of mine, let's hunt these men. Come on now, follow me, carrying the thyrsus as our weapon. Now remember, um, in a previous video, we had reference from Cadmus, when Cadmus and uh, Pentheus were fighting about whether Pentheus should praise Dionysus or not, Cadmus says, beware what happened to Acteon. The Acteon myth is a myth in which Acteon is killed by his own hunting dogs because he dares to say that he's better than Artemis. So it's an act of what we call hubris, believing you're better than a god. And again, there's a clear nod to the Acteon story in the messenger report here because Agarwe calls the Minads swift hunting dogs of mine. So the idea that it's your personal hunting dogs, it's your own that destroy you. And that's gonna become really important for Pentheus because it's Agarwe herself that pulls him to pieces. So we get these layers um, of irony starting to build up, but the messenger is verifying a lot of really important points and none of them are Pentheus's points. Pentheus has got this all wrong. So his conclusion is, um, having seen that, that really the Bacchae are able to, able to overpower the men in the mountains, the messenger is a survivor. So the messenger says at 760, the men's sharp swords got not a drop of blood. The women held their thyrsuses and hit, wounding their enemies and routing them. Such things could not have happened without a god. Returning to the place from which they came, they used the streams the god had sent for them to wash away the blood. Snakes came and licked the last drops away from their bright cheeks. So then, my lord, whoever this god may be, accept him into Thebes. So the Bacchae clearly have a supernatural strength. Um, and he says, you know, just it's not safe to be opposing this god. So the messenger speech does several things as a device within Euripides' tragedy. It verifies what the Bacchic chorus have said. It undermines what Pentheus has said. It reiterates the imagery of the Acteon myth as a cautionary tale for Pentheus to look out for. And it asserts the idea that the god is allowing extra potency to his followers just as Cad, um, Cadmus and Tiresias believed they could walk to the mountain with the help of the god, um, so too can the women exert an extra level of strength because they are supported by Dionysus. And this is something that the messenger verifies at every point here. Okay, I hope that was helpful for you in Mead in the back eye. If you stay safe and well, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share the videos as well to keep the channel going. All right, see you next time.